Um, in 2014, the first World Ayahuasca Conference was held in Ibiza. So why Ibiza? And that's what I'm here to really briefly talk about today. I lived in the countryside in Ibiza for nearly eight years. And I spent the last few years researching and writing a book about the history of how people party in Ibiza, i.e. a history of, well, how far back Ibiza established the identity by which we know it today. And by identity, I'm not talking about that tabloid soundbite representation of Ibiza. I'm talking about the culture as we know it, or those of us who actually know the island, or those of us, and I imagine there's quite a few in, in this community, who are aware of the level of interest in evolving consciousness that's gone on on the island, certainly in the last few decades. Well, in the course of my research, I realised that this is something that is actually centuries old. If we look at how people celebrate the sunset, for example, in Ibiza, there are so many beautiful spots where you can really imagine as far back as the Phoenicians, who were the earliest settlers on the island, that they'd just be sitting and watching the sunset from these extraordinary vantage points all over the island. Because its position and its relief basically mean that it's also got this extraordinary light. And that light has notably he attracted quite a lot of artists over the years, of course. So the actual physical geography of the island is really important when we start considering <coughs> things like this and why people like to go there. To start, it's a really good place for contemplation. And this is due also to a combination of the very clean air, the very pleasant weather. You get plenty of rain and you get plenty of sunshine. And then you've got evergreen forests and fields and then there's this wonderful sense of space in the traditional countryside architecture. All of that is really alluring, as is the fact, and this is crucial, that the island's really small. So it's about just less than 45 kilometres by 25 kilometres at the most. Um, although it makes a hell of a lot of noise for somewhere so small, people are quite often surprised at just how small it is. And then it's in the middle of a sort of cluster area. Obviously, it's as close to Algiers and North Africa, the southern Mediterranean, as it is to Barcelona, western Mediterranean. Um, it's surrounded by other islands and big Mediterranean centres such as Marseille that are obviously very, very old. So while that's meant that there's been a lot of influences washing in, the things that have really stayed are things that have been able to work in a society where infrastructure is never going to be a major concern. So the island's small. There just aren't enough people there all year round for it to be of huge interest to big business, to big pharma, to big anything. In fact, it's a bit rinky-dink most of the time, no matter what people say. And frankly, I find that very much to its advantage. Yes, there are crowds there in summer for the summer season, but outside of that, the island's not big enough to cope with year-round crowds and healthy capitalist living. So something else has happened there over time, which is that a gentler, quieter kind of community has always been attracted to living there. And because Ibiza is so small and quiet in the long so-called off-season, which actually runs from about the end of October through to, say, Easter. That's a pretty long off-season. So it sort of gets left behind places like Mallorca, which is open all year round for tourism and therefore open all year round. Um, this means Ibiza gets left behind in other ways, legally a little bit too. The all-year-round all local police on the island are very different from the mainland police who are drafted in to help out from Madrid during summer, for example. So on the whole, over the past few decades, people have been somewhat left to get on with living in a relatively free environment. There's a lot of tolerance in the community, and that also applies very much to the locals, the Ibisencos. This is partly because they've been invaded so many times. And over the centuries, Ibiza's been Islamic, it's been Christian, it's been ruled by everyone from Phoenicians through Carthaginians, Moors, Romans, obviously Catalans and Castilians, and along the way, Visigoths, barbarians, and pirates. Pirates actually ruled the island for a while. They still do in, in, in many ways, actually. But the Ibisencos tend to live to an old age, older than Brits. 
Um, and until the 1960s, apparently, they didn't go to doctors. They went to the kitchen cupboard or the garden, and they turned to plants for everything. Aloes, salvia, chamomile, opium poppy, tobacco, datura, cannabis, mushrooms, all grown locally, all used locally. Basically, when the doctors came along in the 60s, um, it was because by the late 60s, mass tourism had started. And with mass tourism came questions of holiday companies' insurance. And holiday companies' insurance involved making sure that there'd be doctors authorised to take care of tourists. But who knows? You know, if it had never become a tourist island, who knows? Anyway, so there's a long history of knowledge of and proof of how well plant medicines work in Ibiza. So on a really day-to-day -day level, you've already got this kind of consciousness within the native community, and that creates an excellent backdrop for anyone who wants to come to the island and try something out. And Ibiza is a place where people have always tried things out. But it really became well known as such a place in the early 1960s when it was starting to attract something of the jazz, local and international community from Barcelona, and so-called dropouts and travellers. And I say travellers because, again, this was before mass tourism as such. And they'd be coming from the US and South America, and, of course, as well, from Europe. And a lot of people were quite likely joining the hippie trail. So Ibiza, which used to be incredibly cheap to live in as well, and that's something that's gotten forgotten over the years because it's now the most expensive place to live in Spain. But it was incredibly cheap and you could live on, on pennies there. And it became a base where people would then drop in on their way to places such as Afghanistan, Iran, India, Morocco. Or perhaps they'd drop in on their way back from those places on their way home to London, Paris, New York, Amsterdam. And generally, because the hippie trail, obviously, as some of you will know, went north, it would mean people would come off about Paris and then come down to Barcelona to see some friends, and inevitably, stories would lead them onto the islands and Ibiza. So once they got there, this meant touching base with what was fast becoming this local freak community, if you like, which was based around these jazz bars around the port and the old town, although parties usually took place in country villas or on the beach in wide open natural spaces. So by the mid-60s, it's claimed that there were only about 100 foreigners in this so-called freak community, and everyone knew each other. And there was always someone coming in from some far-flung place tailed with, filled with tales of travel, exotica, tales of experimentation, and of course, tales of spiritual awakenings. So there might be South American travellers coming in, bringing tales of shamanism and jungle plant medicines. But also people would be coming back along the hippie trail from India and Nepal, and they'd got interested in Hinduism, Buddhism, and all these folks integrated in Ibiza in this little community. And the epicentre of this little community was a bar called Domino, which is my one photograph. And it's a very interesting photograph. This was actually taken in 1960, so years before hippie as such. You've got the beatniks here, I guess. <coughs> and um, this crowd um, is probably largely Dutch. Um, second from right, we have Jan Kramer, the Dutch writer. Um, I, I don't know who the photographer is, but as I say, we do know it was taken in 1960. So that would have been the kind of interesting international crowd back then. Um, Cannabis was growing on the island and had probably been growing there since the 10th century when the Moors would have brought it over from <coughs> North Africa. The Moors significantly also brought drum trance rituals, which still form quite a big part of a lot of community rituals in the north of the island, but also traditionally played a part through the 70s, 80s, and 90s in club culture too. Less so now, but during that period, there'd always be gangs of drummers turning up at clubs and taking over the chill-out terraces, and it was just par for the course in Ibiza. It's something I haven't seen in any other country. So this Moorish influence, um, which is seen, obviously, every year in the age-old Jujuka rites in Morocco, it's a Berber Sufi trance as healing thing, and this trance as healing culture came over to the island with the Moors, and it's never really gone away. 
So you also have to bring in the Goa link here, obviously, as since the 60s, something of this hippie trance crossover culture has been a feature of Goa parties too. And there's long been a big transmigration of people to Goa in winter, also to Puna, to the Otto communes, and then back to summer, back to Ibiza in summer. And obviously these communities have continued to inform each other over the years. There's still that transmigration today. The numbers are slightly less, but it's still there. Um, and you've now got three generations of people who've grown up doing that transmigration. Narratives about brain blood volume and the benefits of trepanation were also catalyzing in the foreign community in Ibiza in the early 60s. And word of all this was spreading far and wide as people were experimenting with things and then going back to wherever they'd come from and spreading news of this lifestyle in Ibiza. So word of mouth and slowly like-minded people started filtering in, not, pour, not quite pouring in yet, but this lifestyle, even back then, often included three-day, four-day outdoor parties on the beach in a forest where people would drop in, drop out, bring their drum, their guitar, come and spend the evening, then maybe go home and eat or sleep for a few hours, then go back, or just stay up for three days. So by the time nightclubs got huge at the end of the 80s and tales of three-day disappearances were being reported as scandalous in Ibiza, it was just a continuum of what had been happening since the 60s anyway. And back then, obviously, the parties were very mellow, and that's the period when Chill Out was born. Everyone smoked, and these gatherings evolved into trance parties as more exotic instruments were being introduced by travellers who'd be on their way back from India with a sitar or some beautiful instrument. So playing music outdoors at sunset became a really big thing, and the sunsets never stopped being a really big thing there. So back for a moment to this famous Dutch community of artists and writers. Um, they moved and shook, and they lived in, mainly in Plaid and Bossa, which is the long golden beach outside of Ibiza town. And in their community, they had a lot of psychedelic ceremonies. Um, a Dutch was a really big one. And so Bart Hughes, who was the trepanation advocate, was one of the Dutch community. And poets Simon Vinkenoog and Hugo Klaus were others, along with Jan Kramer, who I pointed out, and many others. Meanwhile, in London, in Oz, the underground magazine, which was coming out of West London, a guy called Neil Phillips, who was described by Jenny Fabian, the writer, as a legendary traveler, doper, and scribbler, Neil settled in Formentera, the island next door to Ibiza, and started researching Yohimbina, which was from the African Yohim plant, which in those days, Yohimbina was available in Ibiza local pharmacies as a libido enhancer. So Neil tucked in happily and wrote an amazing report for Oz about this. You could just go into pharmacies and buy this kind of thing back then. He called it ecstasy. He literally called it ecstasy in his report. Interestingly, Jenny Fabian told me that after she'd written her London countercultural scene book, Groupie, she achieved some level of fame and she really wanted to escape from things. So off she went to Ibiza and Formentera with some friends from London, including musician Hank Wangford. But she said one of the things that impressed her most about the community in Ibiza was that people were much less impressed by celebrity than they were by daring. So if you, you could be a sort of unknown person coming back from Iran and you risked something for the sake of trying out a plant medicine or, or you know, helping someone out of uh, jail or whatever, and you'd be held much more in much higher esteem in the Ibiza community than all the sort of celebrity musicians who were dropping in and out the whole time. Basically, it was how far you journeyed and what tales you had to tell and, you know, how far you were willing to kind of share things with the community that interested people. So all the first actual nightclubs on the island were created by hippies, as it were, and it was just a place, it was just a, a place to put people, the first nightclubs, where they could have louder music because by now sound systems had evolved and so you wouldn't be bothering the locals. But those clubs back then didn't have enclaves. There was no VIP. Um, so you'd have, you know, international celebrities, European royalty, but also gangsters, criminals, drug dealers, who have you. Off, people often on the run, but hiding as ever in plain sight in Ibiza. 
in fact, until fairly recently, the most famous clubs were open air or enclosed wall-wise, but with at least in part no roof. It's relatively recent that the roofs have come into play, i.e. since the 80s. And again, that's only out of concern for the neighbours as music systems got louder, PA systems were introduced. And that's fair enough. But it's important to remember that all those Ibiza clubs that are now known notoriously for other things now, uh, which is a shame, they were all set up to embrace nature, bring in the sunrise and complete social integration. So there's been obviously plenty of coverage about the place of MDMA in Ibiza club life from the late 80s onwards. But what is always less discussed is this clear continuum of the use of psychedelics from the use of plants on the island over centuries, the experimentation with LSD, etc., in the 60s, and being, for example, able to take advantage of a system where if you had asthma, you could walk into the local pharmacy and buy, uh, of all things, a cigarette made with tobacco from the island and datura from the island. And apparently this is very good for asthma. So, you know, and, you know, Ibisenkans were then living to be 90 and stuff, you know, so. And cough syrup that contained opium could also be bought until relatively recently in local pharmacies. All grown on the island, all this stuff. So by the time the MDMA club scene came along, the way was sort of well paved. And in fact, MDMA was already in use by the Osho community in Ibiza in their empathy workshops. And it was they who famously helped spread the good message in clubs and in the local community. And especially at one very famous club which has gone down in history called Amnesia, which was opened by one Antonio Esco Hurtado, who some of you may know. <laughs> Um, and it became the place that Ibiza Acid House was born. So Antonio had been a sociology lecturer in Spain. He was a known campaigner for drug reform. He got busted. This went against him. He got vilified because of his campaigning, ended up in jail, from where he wrote a marvellous three-volume history of drugs in 89. So as I say, he and his wife had had this bourgeois life in Madrid, come to Ibiza, got into the whole consciousness, LSD, cannabis, and opened amnesia, and turned it into what many considered to be the greatest club in Europe or the world. Of course, there has been plenty of bad publicity along the way for the community too. In fact, in 1966, an excruciating film called Hallucination Generation, which some of you may know, was shot in both Barcelona and Ibiza about potheads and beatniks. And it's a sort of LSD geared version of the dreaded reefer madness. But I bring it up because it had to be made in Ibiza. It couldn't have been made in Mallorca or Sicily or Sardinia. Then Barbe Schroeder famously made his film More at his mother's house in Punta Galera on the west of the island. And there are scenes with this young couple who've arrived from Paris and gorgeous scenes of them living this incredibly simple life in nature, getting stoned, beautiful blue skies, the Mediterranean, green breezes. Mm. And it, it does all go dark when they get hooked on heroin later. But earlier on, there are some wonderful scenes in the hippie community at an outdoor party, which must have been a real party that he filmed with drummers and bringing down the sunset, bringing up the sunrise and so on. And again, films like that weren't being made on other Mediterranean islands. So this beautiful landscape, and Pink Floyd did the soundtrack. And in fact, this landscape and light very much also informed the image of Pink Floyd in the album art that was created for them by Storm Thorgerson and Aubrey Powell of the design group Hypnosis, uh, who have both have told me that they were hugely influenced by the light in Ibiza and Formentera, not just for Pink Floyd's image, but in many of the album art that they used. Um, staying on the subject of sometimes beautiful depictions of Ibiza in the 1960s, I want to mention and recommend a book called Dope in the Age of Innocence by Damien Enright, the Irish writer. He beautifully describes the Ibiza town portside bar scene and the obsession with jazz that so much of the local international community had. And his descriptions of getting together with friends and enjoying the beauty and simplicity of life and turning on is so evocative. In fact, it became known as such a hippie island that when these same port bars were cleaned up in 1973 for a visit by the Spanish prince Juan Carlos, he was quoted as asking the Ibiza mayor 
hey, what have you done with my hippies? He'd evidently come to see. Um, the longest running club night in Ibiza, I believe, is Flower Power. Uh, despite all the cutting edge techno that's been premiered in clubs on the island and all the different new moods in electronic music over the years, the one night everyone seems to agree that they love, and I'm talking about top DJs I've spoken to, and then I know locals of all ages, teens, 70 somethings, what have you, is Flower Power. It's corny and it's wonderful, and it's at Pasha, which is the island's nightclub because Pasha's open all year round. Flower Power was one of the first nights at Pasha in the 70s, and it was set up by one of the founding brothers of Pasha. So it's very Ibiza. It's the Beatles, monkeys, birds, lots of <coughs> 60s pop, and people get dressed up in swinging London-type clothes or hate Ashbury 67 shamelessly and adoringly, and it's wonderfully unselfconscious. And everyone knows it to be a really relaxing and fun night, and consider it quintessentially Ibiza including hip young DJs who told me it's their favourite night on the island. <laughs> and it's still a weekly event. It's continued non-stop. So there's still a lot of experimentation with new plants and so forth on the island as well. In fact, I first heard about ayahuasca on the island, obviously a few years ago, but still. And indeed, more recently, the Buffo Alvarius Sonoran Toad. Basically, the hippie culture in Ibiza for want of a better term, the hippie culture in Ibiza never went away. When other Euro centres were anti-hippie in the 80s, as we know London was, for example, in Ibiza, the whole fashion ethos stayed geared to Eastern consciousness and clothing, yoga, vegetarian food. Consciousness was king, always. And it's interesting that when that lifestyle became chic again, just after the millennium, a lot of UK mags started calling it Ibiza chic which is superficial rubbish, but it hijacks the look and, in effect, the ethos of a community that was pretty genuine about their interest in evolving consciousness and, to some extent, has remained so. Thanks.